This is Joe Stoll. Thanks for joining me on today's Daily Strength. You're well aware of the fact that in politics, the paths to success and significance are paved with the right contacts, the right connections. You know, it's the old, it's not what you know, it's who you know. In Chicago, which is my adopted hometown for the last 20 years, a series of recent investigations and indictments have unearthed the seamier side of politics. Favors, premium jobs have been doled out in exchange for campaign funds and a whole list of other perks. Sadly, the common defense in most of these cases has been, well, that's just politics. <laughs> it's just how things are done. As one comedian aptly put it, you know it's cold in Chicago when the politicians have their hands in their own pockets. Actually, from an Earthside point of view, there may be some advantages to a political approach to life. You know, the kind of world that is all about who you know and what have you done for me lately. We are primed early on in life to look out for ourselves and to do whatever it takes to not miss the big break. But if you see yourself as a follower of Christ, that kind of thinking actually bears little resemblance to his life and his teaching. Take, for instance, the encounter that Jesus had with two of his most committed disciples, an encounter that only goes to prove that even the spiritually best of us can still have those political instincts alive and well down deep inside. James and John grab for the brass ring as they try to cash in on some relational capital. Matthew twenty twenty one seems to indicate that James and John may have convinced their mother to petition Jesus for some plum cabinet positions in the new kingdom. She says to Christ, with them standing on either side, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other on your left in your kingdom. Wow, what a bold request. But, you know, if you don't stick up for yourself, who will? What were these guys thinking? Probably the same kind of thoughts that cross our minds as we think about our role in Jesus' plan. Like, I'm sure I could be doing that job much better than the other person. When is God going to entrust that kind of position to me? Or serve as an usher? <laughs> no thanks. But don't forget to call me when that elder position is open. Any of those sound familiar? Sadly, I don't think I'm alone in battling the inborn desire to be noticed, to be affirmed, and to feel significant. Scripture records that the other disciples were visibly ticked at James and John's request, probably because they had been beaten to the punch and James and John had used their mother in the process. Talk about lowball and unfair leveraging of relationships. That took the cake. Well, is there a cure? You bet. The cure for this disease of, hey, how about me, self-promotionitis, is found in the response of Christ when he said to James and John and the other disciples, Whoever wants to become great among you must first be your servant. Wow, a servant? The one who quietly and humbly submits to and serves the desires of others regardless of personal recognition? <laughs> Doesn't sound much like the world's path to significance, does it? But it is the path that Jesus took. Before going all the way to the cross, he told his disciples, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. You know, if we're still striving to be like Christ, then no task is beneath us. No person is ever below us, and no legitimate sacrifice is too great. From Jesus' point of view, servanthood is the path to significance. Or as a friend of mine says, in the kingdom, the way up is down. So let's drop the old, what will others do for me routine and get on with serving others as Jesus served us and start the project today.